Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our God. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, there are so many invitations we get and some we choose to respond to and some we do not. But Lord, you call on our heart. You call on us. You call us into community. You call us to worship. You call us to each other. And you are calling us right now. May we have ears to hear and heart to receive the message you have for us on this first Sunday of Advent as we reflect on hope. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, folks, out there in Facebook land and Zoom land and even the few of our leaders that are gathered here. I have sort of bit the bug, that bug where you begin to watch Christmas movies. I'm not looking at traditional ones, but I did happen to look at a movie that came out this year called New York Christmas Wedding. It's a story that begins with an engaged couple whose fiance's mom is taking over their wedding arrangement. In a fury, while they're sitting at a table, by the way, the bride runs out and she runs into an angel and that angel gives her the opportunity to go back to her past when her best friend was alive. You see, she had a BFF in high school when she had lost her mom and her best friend and her were super close. And they had this argument. And as it would go sometimes with arguments, they never made up. And then her friend uh, died. And so in this movie, the angel gives her a chance to go back in time when her friend was alive and to replay that scene all over again. And she does things differently. Toward the end of the movie, there's an interesting twist. The angel gives her a choice that she can stay present in this life and move forward, or she can go back to the past and start from the past. She chooses to go back to the past and to mend her relationship with her best friend and to stay there. This main character chooses to go back in time. My grandmother had a porch and on that porch, the porch was attached to the back of her home. And on that porch was a table. And often in the summer we would go and we'd sit there and we'd sit at the table. 
And I love the back porch because it had a nice screen. So you could be outdoors but not really be outdoors. And in the south, it's important to have a screen because the mosquitoes can't get to you. So you could be outside and you could hear all the wonderful sounds of night like the cicadas. You could hear those beautiful sounds. And there would be my mom and relatives and they would sit at this table and they would begin to relive memories. Usually on the table there might be some homemade wine or some beer or some other spirits, but they would sit around a table and they would begin to talk about a past that I knew nothing about, a past that I had not been around for. And there would be this shine in their eyes as they sat around the table and they laughed and they shared stories about the good old days. It was like they had their own club of past memories. You see, often the past can be tempting for us. Often the past, when we look at it, can be a place that feels like so many wonderful things happened. Barbara Streisand in these lyrics says, memories light the corners of my mind. Misty, water-colored memories of the way we were. Scattered pictures of the smiles we left behind. Smiles we gave to one another for the way we were. Can it be that it was all so simple then? Or has time rewritten every line? If we had the chance to do it all again, tell me would we? I read one comedian this year that said that if we, all the predictions that we had about 2020 were false. We all got it wrong. None of us could have predicted that in the year 2020 that we would have had this year that we had. This has been quite a year and with only a few more weeks left in this year and yet the beginning of the Christian liturgical calendar starts this Sunday. If there was ever a time it was tempting to want to go back to the past, to remember the way things were. But instead, fires burn across the globe. There are thunderstorms and hurricanes. Remember this summer how many trees were torn up just in Chicago from the tornado we experienced. There's the rise of white nationalism, and then there's Black Lives Matter and alley ship across the TV. There's a contentious election season that further divides an already fractured nation. And we are now facing the second wave of a global pandemic. And I can't for the life of me understand why there are so many people in the airport and so many people out gathering. And here we are. But there are no angels to transport us back to the past. There are no angels to get us out. We do not get to go back to the way things were. We are faced with the way things are. The, our Israelites, our Israelite, the Israelites, our ancestors were not so very different from us. They had perpetual years of torment and they too found themselves remembering the way things were. Remember when the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt. Remember when the Lord fed us in the wilderness. Remember when the Lord sent those flags and let the Egyptians free us. Remember the promised land. Remember when life was good. Remember when we could feel how special we were to God. Remember when we were God's chosen people and others knew it. Remember. Remember the way things were. Do you remember? Do you remember? In these last chapters of Isaiah, the people of God seem to facilitate between hope and despair, between remembering how things were and remembering how they are. Certainty and dismay, assurance and desperation. The Israelites have returned from living in Babylonian exile to be reunited with those who remained in the territory of Judah. Their return and reunion, however, do not signify restoration. They are not yet whole. The text tells us that Jerusalem is broken. Paul, Shalom and Paul writes, following its destruction and the first days of the return, Jerusalem in the time of the prophet is described as desolate and unconsolable. 
Deutero Isaiah portrays the city as a bereaved and barren widow. Rather than celebration, the, review, the reunion presents a return to a place that only shadow its former glory and a profound disappointment among the people who had been waiting for this day. They remembered the way things were before all of the bad things happened. Today, I invite you to a table to explore and ask God, what does it mean for us to carry hope in the midst of rooms? I invite you to a round table. I like round tables because there's no clear distinction of someone being in charge, but we're all equal kind of around a round table to be a part for all voices to be heard. I invite you to a round table to sit with this question the prophet has put out there. If God can do what no one else can do, what might God do for us? right now, the way things are. First, we have to face the fact that maybe God is angry. The Israelites certainly felt like God was angry with their lack of faithfulness. It is a burdensome noose, the sense that God is not only angry, but that God has left the building. God feels terribly absent as they pick up the pieces of their life. These folks are hurting and they're broken and they come face to face with a God that perhaps is angry with them. Maybe God is angry with us. Maybe not. Maybe God is angry with how Christians are living their lives. Maybe God is angry with our silence on critical issues. Maybe God is angry that often we go along with the dominant culture. We really don't seem all that radically different. Maybe God is angry with the dimness of our lights. Maybe God is angry with our evangelism. Maybe God is angry with our commitment like the Israelites. I don't know how many of you guys know Will Smith, but Will Smith got his first break in the movies with the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. A lot of kids grew up on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and I was one of them. Anyway, they had a reunion, or they're about to have a reunion, and Will realized that he had been out of relationship with Aunt Viv. Aunt Viv, Aunt Viv and him haven't talked for 30 years. Will said some things about her. When he was on the set, he felt like in his insecurity that she didn't like him. And so Will put some words out about her, describing her kind of as the angry black woman. But what Real did not realize is that his words impacted Aunt Viv's life. When she left the scene, she was unable to get a job. She was in an abusive relationship. Her family looked down on her. She was never able to recover from it, and a couple of years ago, she put out an angry video to Will. Got a million looks. Will realized that he couldn't do the reunion without Aunt Viv, and so he bit the bullet, and he invited her to a conversation. And when they got together, what do you think Aunt Viv did? Aunt Viv gave him a piece of her mind. I mean, she didn't hold back. She was not nice at all. I listened to it. But he had initiated this meeting. And after she had told him what he had done to her, after she had given him all of her anger, in that moment he took a breath. He didn't say any words. He didn't try to defend himself. He didn't try to put it back on her. He didn't try to do many of the things we try to do when people give us anger. But he stood in the middle of the ocean with the wave that knocked the wind out of him, and he took a breath. And he went with Aunt Viv on a journey. Sometimes the best thing we can do when other people are angry with us is to hear it and to accept it and to go on the journey with them and just hear and be in that space <laughs> that they're in. A long time ago, when I was young as well, I had a fear of balloons. It wasn't something I wanted people to know because it's kind of embarrassing 
to be afraid of balloons. I was in college and I was at a festivity and there were all these balloons and somebody at this festivity tied a balloon to my book bag. I was okay, I was trying to cope. I walked back to my dorm, I got on the elevator and I began to hear a sound and fear took over me. And as soon as the elevator doors opened, I busted out of the elevator and started running. I dropped my backpack and took off down the hall. At some point, I was able to kind of think I needed to go back and get my book bag. <laughs> and so I made my way back to the book bag. And I saw the thing that had caused me all the fear laying there with no air in it. Here's the thing about anger. It's like air in a balloon. And when we release it, once it's out, it's all out, it's not so scary as it seems at first. Are you all sitting with me at this table today? The table on the screen today was shared with us by Kara Griggs, who is from Richmond, Virginia. Her grandparents gave this table to her parents after her parents were married. And Kara has this to say about this table. The table and chairs were almost new at the time, and we think that they did not fit the decor after my grandparents downsized and moved. The marks on the chairs are from when my parents, St. Bernard, was teething. I arrived a few years after that. Our highest and lowest moments as a family have played out around that kitchen table. Notice it's a round table. <laughs> The table has been the site of countless meals in our self-assigned chairs and has served as a place for a wide array of projects. I can remember my father grading papers and sorting through endless quantities of paper, my mother editing manuscripts and wrapping gifts, and my own activities, which ranged through the years from Lego castles to grad school homework. We don't sit at tables as much anymore. We sit in front of televisions, and we sit in beds, and we look at gadgets. But long ago, tables held whole families together. We sat down together. We prayed together. You bet not touch that food till you say a prayer. And we shared a meal together, and that was sacred. And I want us this morning to gather together at a table and discuss what it means for us to hold on to hope because we are not going to get transported to the past. The air is out of the balloon. God's anger is something to consider. And this is the way that things are. The author of this chapter doesn't only remember the way things are, but wants God to intervene now. Have you ever wanted God to intervene now? Oh God, if you would come down here and straighten things out. Oh God, when you show up, the ground is shaken. Things change, but you are mad at us. Will your wrath subside ever? Tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. We need the nations to tremble at your presence, oh God. God is a game changer. For the Israelites, holding on to God was their hope. Our hope, too, can be built on nothing less than holding on to God. Last Sunday, many of us gathered on Zoom Speaking metaphorically, we gathered around a table, and I wondered why we hadn't done it sooner. We checked in with one another. It wasn't a business meeting. It was just a meeting of gratitude and a space for us to share how we were doing. And you guys brought your journeys and what you were doing. And then we opened up for prayer concerns, and people really were honest and shared. And it was a sacred moment. And we had some new folks on the phone call, and we had some folks that have been with us long enough to remember the way things were. And we had a rich diversity of singles and widows and couples sitting there together beside each other, and some in different rooms. We 
had a good time, and there was laughter, and there was listening, and there was aching for when we could hug and pass the peace again. And we didn't just remember who we were or the way things sadly are, but we got a glimpse of our future, and it made me hopeful because we are going to be all right. We are going to get through this. Really, we are. This first Sunday of Advent, we reflect on hope. And I hope around your tables, and if you're not at the table, go ahead and get to the table later or have a phone call at the table. I invite you to come to the table of hope. I invite you to come to the table of hope that invites our faith to consider what could be. Because on that phone call last week, we got a glimpse of what could be. Hope generally involves some faith and some belief in the potential of the future and allows us to draw on it right in the present moment. A couple of months ago, we had Halloween and people were like, we can't have Halloween because we're social distancing. And some people gave up on Halloween. I know it's not all that sacred. But I was out there by accident, and I saw how people built little tunnels where candy could slide down and we could social distance. It is amazing that in our DNA, that God has put in our DNA the ability to build bridges the ability to hope. So I invite you to tables, tables full of broken people, because God gives us hope. And I would be curious about the conversations that you are going to have at your table. This month we are inviting people to have conversations, we are inviting people to share their tables, we're inviting you to reach out and send me messages because this month we want to have a conversation about Advent. We want to have a conversation about hope and faith and joy and love. But today, today, we're talking about the way things are. and We are talking about holding on to hope. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, I am so glad that you give us hope. It's not just the birth of a little baby Jesus, but if we just pause and come to the table, Lord, you give us hope. And that hope gives us something to hold on and to hold out for. We thank you for this Advent that allows us to ponder and to anticipate Jesus' birth. It allows us to anticipate the beginning of our Christian journey. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the tables of food and the tables of experience and the tables that you have invited us to. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>